The scripture reading this morning is Mark chapter 14, verses 12 through 31. And on the first day of unleavened bread, when they sacrificed the Passover lamb, his disciples said to him, where will you have us go and prepare for you to eat the Passover? And he sent two of his disciples and said to them, go into the city and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him and wherever he enters, say to the master of the house, the teacher says, where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room furnished and ready. There, prepare for us. And the disciples set out and went to the city and found it just as he had told them. And they prepared the Passover. And when it was evening, he came with the 12. And as they were reclining at table and eating, Jesus said, truly I say to you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They began to be sorrowful and said to him one after another, is it I? He said to them, it is one of the 12, one who is dipping bread into the dish with me. For the son of man goes as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the son of man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he had not been born. And as they were eating, he took bread, and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to them and said, Take, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. And he said to them, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly I say to you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine, until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. And Jesus said to them, you will all fall away, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you into Galilee. Peter said to him, even though they all fall away, I will not. And Jesus said to him, Truly I say to you, this very night, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. But he said emphatically, If I must die with you, I will not deny you. And they all said the same. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Sheila. Thank you, worship team. And good morning, Grace Church. And if you're new to us, welcome. Uh, my name is Dave Ruqua. My wife, Joe, who prayed earlier, and I are recent members here at Grace. And uh, this morning, I have the opportunity to pinch hit for our Pastor Tom, who's on vacation. Uh, pastor Tom has been preaching the Gospel of Mark throughout this year. And there the lights come. Whew, I was debating wearing a cap this morning. We've been, Pastor Tom has been preaching the gospel through the gospel of Mark uh, all through the year. And today we're at a very critical passage that functions as a segue from Jesus' earthly ministry to the events of his crucifixion. And I must confess... Uh, Pastor Tom had asked me a while ago to, to do this, and I've been spending probably months preparing for this message focused on the, the, the story of the Last Supper, and I thought that that would be my focus this morning. But not long ago, it dawned on me that the Last Supper is only a quarter of the passage that Seal just read, causing me to take a fresh perspective on the passage that I'll be uh, sharing with you this morning on the message and on our overall study. And uh, I have to confess, as I did, I kept thinking of the scene from Pixar's film Ratatouille when the antagonist character Anton Ego 
a feared Paris food critic, cynically walks into a restaurant and ominously sat down waiting to be served. And the waiter came to him and asked for his order. Ego sneers and sarcastically say, states, I'd like some fresh, clear, well-seasoned perspective. I have to confess this morning that today I find myself serving you a perspective. And if it is well-seasoned, uh, I'll have to hear that from you afterwards. Mark was likely the first gospel account written. Very likely, it was the first book written of the New Testament. Interestingly, while the Apostle Paul culminated his ministry in Rome, Mark wrote this gospel to the Romans. Earlier in Paul's first missionary journey, Mark was a young man, and he, he left Paul. He bailed. He quit. And there was no small conflict between them at that point. But later, Mark's, uh, Paul said of Mark, he is useful for me in service, and apparently they reconciled, as evidenced by Mark's gospel to the Romans. And in the face of persecution, as first account witnesses began to die, Mark documents the gospel to preserve the truth, to encourage these Roman believers, to strengthen their faith, to remind them that Jesus is the Savior of the world, and to compel those who don't know Jesus to realize how truly great and credible he is. Not being an eyewitness, history tells us that Mark's primary source was Peter. Take note of that as we look through the scripture. Writing to Gentiles, Mark rarely quoted the Old Testament, yet he begins his gospel quoting Isaiah, who wrote, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Reaching back into history, showing how this moment was predicted, Mark quickly presents the baptism of Jesus, the arrest of John the Baptist, and then quotes Jesus, the first words of Jesus in the Gospel of Mark, saying, the time has come. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. Remember that phrase, the time has come. By chapter 2, Mark shows Jesus answering why his disciples don't fast, reiterating his focus on time when he says, how can the guests of the bridegroom fast while he is with them? They cannot. But the time will come, there it is again, when the bridegroom will be taken from them, and on that day they will fast. Have acknowledged, having acknowledged past historic prediction. In this present moment, Jesus now speaks to the future. Of the few parables in Mark's gospel are the parable of the sower and the seeds, the parable of a seed, and then another parable of the mustard seed, each looking into the future. Mark's preoccupation with time is highlighted by his constant reference to immediately, straightway, or other translations of that same Greek word, which in 16 short chapters he uses over 39 times. By chapter 8, after recording many miracles, Mark says, And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things, and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. And he said this plainly, this is when Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. This is Mark's first account of Jesus pr pronouncing his upcoming death. Chapter 9 shows Jesus' magnificent transfiguration, followed by his second prediction of his death, where Mark quotes Jesus saying, After three days he will rise. But they did not understand the saying and were afraid to ask him. In chapter 10, Mark writes, And taking the twelve... Again, he began to teach them what was to happen to him, saying, See, we are going to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles, 
And they will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him. And after three days, he will rise. Could the disciples possibly appreciate that this was not just insight, but foresight? Even today, looking back, we theologically struggle to understand. If he knew what would happen, why would he continue forward? If he were in control, why would such a tragedy take place? Chapter 11, Jesus sends the disciples into Jerusalem for a donkey. Much like in today's passage, we see him sending them into Jerusalem to prepare the upper room. Did he coordinate this as a good organizer? Or does he know in advance? Well, then there was his triumphal entry where Jesus was praised by the people. And then Jesus cleansed the temple, causing the religious leaders to question his authority. Who do you think you are? And that's the whole point, isn't it? As the ways of Jesus confront the ways of mankind, it forces the question, who does he think he is? God? In chapter 12, Jesus teaches values, starting with taxes and ending with a widow and her seemingly small tithe. And in between, Jesus corrects the religious leader's views on the resurrection and the future kingdom as if he had been there, provoking a public match of credibility. Now, the leaders challenge Jesus' presumption, asking essentially, oh yeah? Well, which is the greatest law? Jesus graciously and wisely answers. And seeking to maintain their authority, they affirm Jesus' response, explaining why he is correct. But this backfires as Jesus responds by telling them, well, you're close, but you're not in the kingdom. The match ends when Jesus challenges them with a question from the Psalms, history, and why David, the ultimate Jewish legend, would call the future Messiah Lord, even though the Messiah would be his descendant. All of this was public, as if there was a giant scoreboard showing Jesus moving further ahead while the current authorities had yet to score. And the match ended with Jesus' authoritative perspective of the past, the present, and the future. And in chapter 13, while the disciples marveled at the grandeur of the temple, Jesus explained how feeble it is, and that not a stone would remain in place. And those reading Mark's account would soon realize or already realized how very accurate that prediction was. And then Jesus explains the future, saying, stay alert, be on guard, or as Pastor Tom summarized, keep your eye on the ball. Two weeks ago, our brother Bob summarized Jesus' teaching at the end of chapter 13, saying that we should spend our time getting ready, not in useless speculations, but pray while we watch and prepare for his return. And in Bob's words, and and I hesitate here, because I can't say Bob's words the way Bob says Bob's words. The man has a gift. But at the risk of embarrassing myself, he said, The fact that there are no restrictions on time of his return lends credibility to his majesty. God is clearly outside of time and is thus not restricted by it. God is above and beyond all time. This is how we ended chapter 13. And so last week at chapter 14, Pastor Tom showed how Mary gave her precious ointment to Jesus. Others only saw a weeping, pathetic prostitute foolishly wasting valuable perfume, bothering the noble teacher. But the teacher called her actions beautiful. The others, like self-appointed economists, only thought of the opportunity cost. What else could have happened with this money? What else could she have done with the perfume? So what was it that made her actions so beautiful? Well, Jesus knew how she got the money for that perfume. He also knew why she bought the perfume. And that her sustenance, her identity, and her hope depended on her appeal. That bottle represented all that she was. 
She could have used a small amount with similar effect, but what she did expressed something far more profound. She gave it all up. She broke it. There is no turning back. She didn't care what others thought. She didn't care what it cost. Her actions were born from a radical confrontation of her life to that of Jesus. And in that confrontation, she rejected all she had been, all that she was and all that she hoped to be. Shame or propriety were not on her mind, only Jesus. Receiving his goodness, she chose to follow him, believing, as the Apostle Paul would later teach, that if anyone is in Christ, they're a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things, all things are become new. One's attitude toward Mary's gesture is a test, as Tom pointed out, then and now, of who you see Jesus to be. For yes, if he were just a man, her actions were a waste, and Jesus would be foolish for calling her actions a beautiful thing. But if Jesus is Lord, her actions were beautiful. And then, with another nod to the future, Jesus explains she has anointed my body beforehand for burial. And this brings us to today's passage. Mark 14, verses 12 to 31. And here we find four sets of verses, each forming a coherent, independent thought. These are called pericopes, a pericope. And each one of these four pericopes is rich with meaning and warrants its own study, its own message. But this is where perspective comes in. If we were handed a microscope or a magnifying glass or a telescope, it would change our perspective. Instead, we are handed a watch. And so we'll use the remainder of our 30 minutes immediately to show how these four pericopes together transition us from Jesus' earthly ministry to his death on the cross in preparation for the role of the church. Now, having already read the text, I'm going to read an edited version here for time's sake. And as I do, I want you to listen to what each of these four pericopes have in common. Pericope, number one, verses 12 to 16. The preparation of the feast. And on the first day of unleavened bread, when they sacrificed the Passover lamb, his disciples said to him, where will you have us prepare the Passover? And he said to them, go into the city, and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. And the disciples found it just as he had told them. Jesus knew what Judas was plotting, yet Jesus had critical things to convey to his disciples in the short time that he had left. So Jesus kept the location of their last meal a secret. People debate whether Jesus arranged this in advance as a good, well-connected organizer or was looking into the future for knowledge. Either option is virtuous and well within his capability showing that Jesus predicts and controls future circumstances. Jesus predicts and controls future circumstances. Pericope number 2, verses 17 to 21. The prediction of betrayal. And when it was evening, he came with the twelve, and as they were reclining at the table and eating, Jesus said, Truly I say to you, one of you will betray me. And they began to be sorrowful and to say to him one after another, Is it I? Is it I? And he said to them, It's one who is dipping in uh, bread into the dish with me, for the Son of Man goes as it is written of him. Jesus announces Judas' betrayal. And here Jesus predicts with confidence human thoughts, attitudes, and choices of the future. But there's more. Notice that phrase, it is written of him. Jesus presents himself as the primary subject of the ancient Old Testament scriptures. 
Consider Jesus' last words to the disciples after he was resurrected, before he ascended into heaven, at the end of Luke's gospel, Luke chapter 24, where Jesus said, everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. Not only does Jesus demonstrate knowledge of people's future thoughts and actions, Jesus is telling his disciples that the ancient scriptures were written about him. Pericope number three, verses 22 to 25. The provision of the Lord's Supper. And as they were eating, he took bread, and after blessing it, broke it, and gave it to them, and said, Take, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank of it. And he said to them, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly I say to you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Three points here. First, Jesus predicts with confidence his future kingdom. Jesus predicts his future kingdom. Second, as I pursue training and credentials to be a marriage and family therapist counselor, this week I was reading in my psychology homework and came across a discussion of the importance of memory as it relates to a person's identity. Listen to these words from a modern secular psychology textbook as we consider the provisions of the Lord's Supper. This is from my homework this week. Most of us experience a sense of wholeness and continuity as we interact with the world. We perceive ourselves as more than a collection of isolated sensory experiences, feelings, and behaviors. In other words, we have an identity, a sense of who we are and where we fit in the overall environment. Memory is a key to this sense of identity, the link between our past, our present, and our future. Without memory, we would always be starting over. With it, our life and identity move forward. Should we be surprised that the author of life should wisely know how to give a new identity of hope to his followers as he says, do this in remembrance of me? Third, this is a little head trippy. Look how Jesus commands time here. Sharing the familiar annual commemoration of the Exodus. When those Hebrews who were delivered thousands of years earlier in Egypt had been covered by the blood of the lamb, marking the sides of the doorposts and the top of the door. To those ancient Hebrews in, in Egypt, this action was reminiscent of their patriarch, Isaac, whose father Abraham was going to sacrifice him on the altar, but God provided a lamb to take his place. And in that upper room in Jerusalem, we see Jesus building on history, giving a memorial tradition for future generations of something yet to happen saying, I am that lamb. And as Jesus dances through time and history, reminiscent of the ironic title, Back to the Future, he gives an object lesson that has solidified the church's identity for 2,000 years. Pericope number four, verses 26 to 31. The pronouncement of denial and when they had sung a hymn, they went on to the Mount of Olives. And Jesus said, you will all fall away, for it is written, there he is again, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered, but after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. 
And Peter said, even though they all fall away, I will not. And Jesus said, truly I tell you, this very night before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. He said, I won't deny you, and they all agreed with him. But with gentle love, Jesus shows historical prediction of his fate, telling people what they will think and do in the next few hours, and foretelling his death and resurrection. In our passage, through four different pericopes, altogether, Jesus confidently predicts future circumstances, other people's future thoughts and actions, his future kingdom, and his future death and resurrection. And for good measure, he shows the ancient scriptures were written about him, predicting this. In the next few days, these disciples will participate in the most cataclysmic events of all history. They will see everything they have believed in, given up their lives for, placed their hope in, and a very dear friend horrifically destroyed before their eyes. Jesus is preparing them. And John records Jesus' intent in his gospel, John 13, saying, I am telling you this now before it takes place, so when it does take place, you may believe that I am he. That's the English Standard Version. To no surprise, the complete Jewish Bible overtly captures what is relayed in the Greek clearly to any Jewish ear, saying, I'm telling you now before it happens so that when it does happen, you may believe that I am. And how it's captured here is how it's written in the Jewish Bible. Jesus is saying, that bush that spoke to Moses, when Moses said, who do I say sent me? Jesus is saying, that's me. There's no question in what Jesus is saying here. That is clear. The question is if they, we, you, believe it. What John states clearly that today's passage illustrates is that Jesus is not simply the Lord of a small religious sect. He's not seeking Levitical recognition or a role in the temple nor is he vying to be influential in local politics. As Messiah, he doesn't seek to challenge, much less conquer or control, the vast Roman Empire. As audacious as it may sound, that's too small of an expectation. Jesus is stating that his authority currently is, always has been, and always will be over time itself. He rules the past. He rules the present. He rules the future. That's why our object lesson for perspective is not a magnifying glass or a microscope, but a watch. In the late 1980s, a Christian music trio called First Call, with upbeat, tight harmonies, released a song called Future. The chorus proclaimed, I may not know what the future holds, but I know who holds the future. I may listen to a thousand tongues, but I only hear one whisper. If I act upon that voice of love, then I know I am a seeker. I can't see much past the present, but I know who holds the future. Can you say that? I may not know what the future holds, but I know who holds the future. Can we trust him? Do we trust him? The Bible tells us that our ways are not God's ways. And when that becomes apparent and our lives become in contrast to his, and it will, whose ways do you choose? Mary chose to trust him. And her story is a memorial challenge to all of us of what it means to call him Lord. In the late 1400s, a painter was commissioned to capture Mark's story that we just read of the Last Supper on the wall of a monk's dining hall in the Santa Maria del Grazie. The artist, his name was Leonardo, from the town of Vinci, had taught his own art students that their art 
without any words, must communicate thought and emotion. He challenged to do this, he challenged his students to go into the marketplace and follow people who were deaf and dumb, who could only communicate without words, and to try to capture what, he, what they observed of them in their artwork. And to this day, we have drawings, sketches of Leonardo's artwork when he did just that himself. Thus, Leonardo represented the thoughts and the emotions of the disciples at this very moment in Mark's gospel in his own work. And his favorite disciple was Thomas. Though disregarded to this day as a doubter, Leonardo, a scientist who scandalously dissected human bodies, they were dead. If they weren't, they were then. He scandalized he scandalously dissected human bodies in order to truly understand human physiology. And he would draw pictures of this, and they became the backbone of medical uh, textbooks for generations to come. And this scientist so valued Thomas, we see Thomas as saying, I doubt it. Leonardo saw Thomas as someone who said, prove it. Leonardo saw Thomas as somebody who demanded empirical evidence. And so, Leonardo painted Thomas with his finger up. That finger that he would one day say, unless I place my finger in his hand, I won't believe. So valuable did Leonardo esteem this trait in Thomas, he could have no other face for Thomas as a model but his own. And it was this Thomas, who we tend to marginalize as a lesser disciple. He was the one that boldly fell down on his face before Jesus and said, My Lord, and what? My God. That was Thomas. And like Mary, everything that Thomas held dear, held dear was confronted by Jesus. And so he abandoned his own preconceptions embracing what he saw in Jesus. And so we as finite beings struggling to survive in an inconceivably unpredictable and oppositional world, we wrestle for meaning and significance, safety, and pursuit of what we deem to be important. And when we inevitably don't understand, will we place ourselves on the throne of life and say, that's stupid. Or will we acknowledge that we are the end of our own comprehension and rest our trust in Jesus? When we reach the point where his scandalous opposition to what we think is right and true, when we reach that point where his way offends our way, will we hold him, him in contempt or we, will we cling to his goodness, acknowledging our own need to learn because he is Lord? When it becomes evident to us that our hopes and dreams, that our very identity are in conflict with him and his character, will we arrogantly reject him or will we have the honesty and the courage to place everything we value on the altar of love and embrace him just like Mary and Thomas did, acknowledging him as Lord and trusting him? Writing to the early church in Rome, Mark knows these believers are in a society that looks down on their faith. In fact, there are times when the culture is in such opposition to the teachings of Christ that believers are flagrantly mocked for their faith, held in ridicule, disregarded. Sound familiar? And at the most extreme, they lose their friends, their liberties, their property, even their life. And so Mark provided the church with a historical book to remind them they may not know what the future holds, but they know who holds the future. Mark encourages them and us to trust in Jesus, and this is what it means to call him Lord. Jesus does not reveal the future so we can have an independent sense of safety or control. We will not. 
He reveals the future so that when hardship comes, we will know that he is God. Jesus said, I have these, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart. I have overcome the world. After the events we read in Mark today, the disciples will spend many hours contemplating their time with Jesus. What he said, what he did, what was done to him. And Jesus deliberately plants the seeds for their contemplation so that when it does happen, you may believe that I am. Throughout the Gospels, we see unease about the future. They watch for a Savior to deliver them, and they need deliverance. Is Jesus the one? If so, what's his plan? When will it happen? If not, what will be the outcome of this Roman occupation? How can we deliver, uh, eliminate Roman control and yet maintain the temple? And if he's not the Savior, who is he? He keeps alluding to his death. What does it mean? Why? What will Putin do next? Where will this war take us? What is the trajectory of global warming? What will future generations deal with? What will gas or milk cost in the future? When will this inflation end? How will we recover? What is happening to our own government? What party and policies will guide the future? Who will be the leader of these causes? We may not know what the future holds, but we know who holds the future. Jesus, Lord over time, said, I'm telling you now, before it happens, so that when it does happen, you may believe that I am. Do you believe? Do you believe? If you're here today and you have never acknowledged that confrontation, you've avoided it somehow, but you've never acknowledged him as Lord in your life, are you willing today to be so honest and so brave as to acknowledge him as your Lord today? If so, John, could you raise your hand? Are you back there? John, just raise your hand. John Lanuza is one of our elders. I too am happy to meet with you up front. Afterwards, we're gonna have a period downstairs sharing uh, some, some treats and getting to know one another. I urge you, if you have come to that point in conflict but never acknowledged him as Lord in your life, I urge you to talk to John or myself or one of the brothers and sisters downstairs. Don't leave this building today without making him Lord of your life. Would you bow your heads in prayer? Lord, we come before you this morning acknowledging you are the Lord of all time, of all past, of all present, and all future. You've proven it over and over again. And as we saw with Mary, and as we saw with Thomas, I pray as we come in conflict with who you are and who we are, we pray, O oh Lord, that we would trust in you, that we would not put ourselves on the throne, but we would acknowledge that you are the one on the throne. I pray that anyone here this day who has not done that would do it before they leave for, your, for their sake, for your sake, and by the grace of your love, we pray in Christ's name. Amen.